Warning, this program will discuss adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. My associate, uh, Father Bochancy, is not in the room, and I will give him uh, due credit when we do have everybody back, either uh, later today or, or tomorrow, Sunday. But he and Angelo are really the architects of uh, this conference. They have done the majority of the work in arranging the talks, the three specialized tracks that we have for uh, clergy, for pastoral ministries, and uh, then the one that Dr. Locke is supervising for the mental health professionals. All I did from time to time was throw a few bombs into their work <laughs> to make sure that they were still paying attention, which they were. And there were one or two people that I suggested that I thought were going to be good speakers, uh, and our next speaker, Emily Stimson, is one of them. Uh, the, the way I got to know her is through this book, These Beautiful Bones, which is downstairs uh, like the other uh, speakers' books that we have always tried to have, and it's subtitled An Everyday Theology of the Body. What I like about it is, and what I think you will like about it and like about her talk, is that it's practical, and it's going to give us a sense, or the book does give us a sense, about how we take virtue, which is a power, a power through which we establish relationships with other people, or, of course, with God, so that we can live in a way consistent with our human nature. And when we do that, of course, that brings us fulfillment. When we step outside of that design, then we have that definition of sin that I was working with last night, uh, which is to say that we bump into ourselves, or uh, we are at war with ourselves, or we, we choose in a way that frustrates the very thing that we want. So that's why the virtues are important. But we have to take that idea of virtue and, and then through the reduction gear, so to speak, make it very practical in the way that we're going to live it in this time, in this relationship, with this person, and in my particular set of circumstances, which are probably not going to be ideal. In a fallen world, the things that we would like to have, we won't. But that doesn't mean that the most important things that the, and the, the things that we need for fulfillment and for peace and joy will not be there. They will be because our Lord promised as much. So Emily Stimson is a freelance Catholic writer based in Steubenville, a place that many of you know, and I've visited frequently in the last year or so, and I highly recommend it. I love the spirit of uh, the university there. And she is the creator of The Catholic Table, a blog about food, friendship, and hospitality. How practical are those things? Do you like red wine? No. All right. No. We're, we're, we're going to get along very well. Her books include this one, which I've already mentioned to you, These Beautiful Bones, and The Catholic Girl Survival Guide for the Single Years, which I have not read. <laughs> but I would probably benefit if I did. Her most recent book, co-authored with Brian Birch, is The American Catholic Almanac, a daily reader of Patriot Saints, Rogues, and Ordinary People Who Changed the United States. That seems another compelling title. Contributing editor to Our Sunday Visitor, which is, by the way, a great supporter of our apostolate. Their foundation uh, is very generous to us on a regular basis. And she's a blogger for catholicvote.org. She writes regularly on all things Catholic, from politics to catechesis to higher education in the media, with a special focus on things that are of great interest to us here, marriage, sexuality, and femininity. Over the years, her writing has also appeared in First Things, Touchstone, Franciscan Way, the NCR, that's the National Catholic Register. I'm not sure you're paying attention. <laughs> I'd like you to write in the National Catholic Reporter. They would benefit from your work. <laughs> and Faith and Family, and elsewhere. Uh, and her work has been honored by the Catholic Press Association and the Associated Church Press and was included in Loyola Best Catholic Writing Series. She holds a Bachelor of Arts from Miami University of Ohio, Creative uh, or uh, Cradle of Coaches, right? 
Isn't that what they call it? Phi Beta Kappa Summa Cum Laude, where she studied political science, history, and English literature. Graduate work in political science at Johns Hopkins and theology at Franciscan U. Theology at the Franciscan U. Before moving to Steubenville, she worked in D.C. as a legislative assistant to Congressman Jim Talent and then worked at the Heritage Foundation where she served as special assistant to former Attorney General Edwin Meese. We're very happy that you're here. Emily, you're going to give us a great talk. God bless you. Welcome. Hello. So sometimes, not very often, but like right now, I wish I were Oprah Winfrey because then I could buy Starbucks for everyone and they would come in the room and they would be handing out the coffee and that would be great. But I'm not Oprah Winfrey. I'm a poor Catholic hack writer. So we're all just going to have to soldier on through till dinner time. Uh, But I am so thrilled to be here. I was speaking at the Defending the Faith conference last week and I felt like the I didn't quite know how I got there because all the really cool kids speak there. And I was like little Emily who came across from, you know, her house two miles away. But when I told them I was speaking here, everybody was so jealous. They're like, oh, my gosh, you're speaking at the Courage Conference? How did you get asked to speak at the Courage Conference? How can I speak at the Courage Conference? So, um, Father Check, you've been aiming a little bit too low. There are a lot of people who are waiting for invites right now. Uh, Okay, before I launch into the talk, there's a few things I want you to know about me because I'm not my resume, and if I had to sit there at 4.30 in the afternoon, I'd want to know who was talking to me about friendship. Um, As Father Check said, I am a writer. It is not as exciting or as fun as it sounds. Um, Basically, I'm reliving my senior year in college over and over and over again. (laughs) You know, but there's never a Christmas break. There's never a summer break. There's only deadlines. Um... It gets worse when you're in the middle of a book, which I am right now. And even though, you know, if you read these beautiful bones, it talks about this lovely Catholic life. It's full of balance and so sacramental. Um, My life does not look like that when I write a book. (laughs) So first I stop calling people back, and then, you know, I'm getting those frantic emails. Are you alive? Are you alive? Um, I'm at the stage now where I'm not really feeding myself, which is super shameful since I run a food blog. Uh, last week for one day for lunch, I had a cucumber and a tin of sardines. So, but fortunately for you, I am at the stage where I'm still showering. So if it were two weeks from now, I would not have the pretty dress on. It'd be like yoga pants and a ball cap and it would be all sorts of bad. All right. So that's my life as a writer. Uh, I'm a revert to the Catholic faith. I grew up in a sort of Casually Catholic house, I was catechized in the 1980s, which says all you need to know about my catechesis. Uh, And when I went to college, I met a very cute Protestant boy. And uh, Protestant boys, bad catechesis, it's just a bad, dangerous combination. So I eventually, when I was 25, found my way back to the church through people like Chesterton and Sheed and Kraft, and I used to talk... Dr. Crafe is not dead, but I used to say I was in love with all these dead white guys. So dead white guys brought me back to the church. I love them dearly. Um, Third and most important thing you need to know for the context of this talk is that I am single. Um, I'm dating someone, but no ring. And I have been single for a very long time. Um, I'm so single I wrote a book to help other women deal with it. Uh, I did not plan on being single and 40. I thought I would get married at 25 and have 10 kids, and that was sort of the vision for my life I had. Um, But as some of you know who have tried dating and looking for a really good, faithful Catholic person, uh, pickings are slim. (laughs) And (laughs) if you want to find someone who is willing to date and marry the church's way, not the culture's way, you know, like if pickings are slim, and then what's there to be picked is not necessarily for you to pick. Uh, it's for someone else. Like, just because they're, like, every good matchmaker everywhere. It's like, look, faithful Catholic, you would be perfect together. And you're like, have you talked to him? Have you talked to me? Uh, so as it turns out, uh, and I do not talk about this in public, but I think for the sake of this audience, it's good for you to hear. Um, through the entirety of my 20s, until I was almost 40, I didn't, was not in a single serious relationship. So I went on lots of dates, but there was nothing, nothing even remotely serious. Uh, just if you asked my mother, she would tell you I was too picky. 
Um, <laughs> you ask some of the guys I went out with, they might say I had commitment issues. Um, but, <laughs> but it wasn't that. It really just was that the right guy had not produced himself, and I was not going to settle for less than the right guy. And then when the right guy did come along, um, there was some waiting involved. And so that's how you end up 39 and the poster child for being a Catholic single woman. Um, all right, the point of that is, even though I'm in a wonderful relationship right now with like, the best boyfriend a girl could ask for, um, is that for most of my young adulthood, I had none of the things that the culture says you have to have to be happy. There was no romance. There was no passion. There was no hanky-panky. Like, there was not an ounce of hanky-panky. Um, <laughs> if MTV had found out about my existence, I probably could have gotten my own reality show. Uh, <laughs> Instead, I just got to write a book that's very cute and pink. And um, Anyhow, but despite all of that, despite what the culture would say, I managed to really enjoy my 20s and 30s. They were happy years. They were rich years. They were fulfilling years. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty normal. Like, I have normal social skills, and I, I can go out and talk in public, and I don't have two heads or a hump on my back from lack of kissing. You know, it's, it was all quite manageable. <laughs> All right, so why was I able to do that? Um, two reasons. First, most obvious, is grace. You know, grace from the sacraments. Grace from, being, from living the life I knew God was calling me to live. Like, doing the hard stuff when it's part of God's plan is a thousand times easier than doing the seemingly easy stuff when it's outside of God's plan. So, grace was huge. Uh, but the second thing was my friends. You know, I had this wonderful, supportive, challenging, trying to be holy, but not entirely succeeding group of friends uh, that listened to me and encouraged me and challenged me and just distracted me when I needed distracting. And that made all the difference for those two decades. So if I had to go back and do it all over again, like, there is nothing I would change. I don't have regrets. I don't go, oh, woe is me. My life is so fantastic now that I have my wonderful boyfriend. It was so bad then. It wasn't. It was good then. It's good now. It's good in different ways. And, you know, God uses seasons. And so we, we look at that. All right. But we're going to move on to the topic now, which is friendship. Um, well, I was really blessed with a wonderful, supportive group of friends. Most people do not have that in this culture today. Um, I'm not a numbers girl, but when I was working on these beautiful bones, I came across this uh, survey called the, uh, the General Social Survey. It's a very exciting title. Uh, so journalists have dubbed it the loneliness numbers. Uh, basically, in 1985, they asked Americans a whole bunch of questions about friendship. Then they did the, ser the uh, survey again 20 years later in 2005. I don't know if I want to know what the numbers are in 2015 or not. They haven't been released yet. Um, but between 1985 and 2005, the average number of friends that most Americans had dropped from three to two. So that's how many close confidence the average American has. 24% of Americans, though, have only one close confident. 19% say they have none. And here's the kicker. 53% of Americans have no close confident to whom they're not related. Okay, so their close confidence are their spouses or their mothers or their sisters. That means the majority of Americans have no close friends. How does something like that happen? Um, we talked a little bit about that, and John talked a little bit about that in his last talk. We are a busy culture. When you're working 60 or 70 hours a week and trying to fit CrossFit in, and you know, how do you make time to, ha to have friends over? Um, we're on the move. And when you move, you leave circles of friends behind, and then you have to make new friends, and then you move again, and the cycle keeps repeating itself till it's hard to maintain those close relationships. Um, and then there's the divorce crisis. When marriages fall apart, groups of friends fall apart. You know, if I can't talk to him anymore because, you know, what he did to Sheila, and so then it just becomes a whole bad, bad circle where we're in a point where 53% of Americans have no close friends. And we've been doing this for a while. We've been busy for a while. We've been on the move for a while. Uh, the marriage culture has been falling apart for a while. And so kids aren't learning from their parents how to do friendship. You know, friendship is something we grow up learning. It's something we experience in a community. And parents can't pass on to their children what they don't have. 
So those are the sociological answers. That's the easy stuff. Um, but I think it bespeaks a larger trend. And that is that we are living in a time of war. I'm not talking about what's going on in the Middle East. I'm talking about a world between worldviews. So it's a world, it's a war between the sacramental worldview on one hand and the modernist worldview on the other hand. Uh, sacramental worldview is the Catholic worldview. It is to see the world as it really is, to see a world where everything was made by God and everything speaks of God. So every bird, every butterfly, every broccoli stalk, you know, everything in creation has a meaning. It has a purpose. You know, it has its place. Uh, the world is imperfect. There was original sin that came and infected everything. But that doesn't mean that everything in creation still isn't an occasion of grace. You know, when you look at the mountaintop, when you look at the sunset, when you look at the broccoli, you should be able to see something about the creator. And because it shows you something of the creator, it should be helping you love him and drawing you closer to him. All right, so that's the sacramental worldview. Modernist worldview says the opposite. It says there is no meaning, there is no purpose, nothing has a place. Um, we get to determine the meaning. You know, that's the only meaning anything in the world has is what we ascribe to it. So if you want to, the cat's only a cat because we call it a cat. The cat could actually be a dog. Um, we get to decide if that's a baby or if it's a clump of cells. We get to decide if we're a man or a woman. You know, it's the meaning is ascribed by us. Um, that kind of power, when you start to believe you have that, goes to your head. And so for a long time, modernists thought that if we could just get rid of all the religion and the royalty and all of these old power structures of the patriarchy, we could make utopia on earth. Okay, so man has the capacity to make a perfect world. That was, the, that was modernism, really, from at least the Enlightenment through World War I. Then there was mustard gas and concentration camps and killing fields. And suddenly that whole utopia on earth thing didn't seem like it was working out. And that led to postmodernism, which is really hypermodernism. It's all the bad things about modernism. There is no meaning. There is no purpose to creation. But it doesn't have any of the optimism. So it leads to a culture of despair. And that's where we are right now. Sacramental worldview is beautiful, but the modern worldview is dominant. Um, and when you have people who don't know who they are, when they don't know why they were made or how they're called to love, you end up with everything falling apart. You have families falling apart. You have communities falling apart. Traditions fall apart. We don't know how we're called to treat other people, and we don't know how we're called to treat ourselves. So it's a great big mess, and in the midst of this great big mess, people are experiencing a tremendous amount of loneliness. Um, I should be clear, this is not just a problem out in the world. You know, it's a problem in the church. You can know the catechism like the back of your hand, but not know how to reach out to someone in love. So what do we do to reverse the course of the culture and the course in our own lives? That is where the theology of the body comes in. Um, the wonderful Dominican priest who spoke here is spoke this morning, he's not here. I never want to disagree with the Dominican. So I'm not disagreeing with the Dominican. I'm just adding some layers to what he said. Um, don't anyone tell him? Um, okay, the theology of the body is not merely a theology of sex. It is not even primarily or fundamentally a theology of sex. Uh, John Paul II is very clear in the theology of the body that what he was writing was a theology of the human person. Uh, it is an anthropology, not a sexology, that looks at, it, looks at what it means to be a man and a woman who is made in the image of God. Uh, if you read John Paul II's encyclicals, if you read his books, you see that anthropology throughout. It's in his encyclical on labor and encyclical on human life. Um, in the theology of the body, he applies it very specifically to the sexual realm in the actual book, The Theology of the Body, um, for the purpose of undoing the contraceptive mindset. But he says in the book, he really wants us to start thinking about the human person this way. So we're not just supposed to limit it to sex. 
That's what I do in these beautiful bones. I talk about it at work and prayer and friendship and spiritual motherhood and father and all the non-sex ways that we can live the theology of the body. Because when you are the Catholic poster girl for chaste uh, womanhood, you got to find some other ways to apply the theology of the body. So, all right. I'm going to talk about it in context of friendship. What does the theology of the body tell us about friendship? Uh, well, remember, the human person is made in the image of God. And who is God? God is a trinity. Trinity Sunday, uh, my nickname for it whenever it comes around on the liturgical calendar, is um, Material Heresy Sunday. Because it's almost impossible to talk about the trinity without saying something that's a material heresy, which is sort of an unintentional heresy. Uh, so I'm going to try and say not much about the trinity to limit my chances of committing heresy. <laughs> but basically, the trinity is a communion of life-giving lovers. So you have the father from all eternity giving everything of himself to the son. You have the son eternally receiving everything the father has to give and giving it all back. And you've got the Holy Spirit who is so real that he's, you know, he's the, bond, the bond of love between the two. He's a third person, the Holy Spirit. And that's the Trinity. It's gift. It's love. And that's how we image God. It's not just that we have intellect and free will and we can choose right from wrong. It's that we were made to give ourselves away in love to others, primarily to God, you know, and to a spouse, but also to our siblings, and to our best friend, and to the lady who checks us out every week at the grocery store. Like every person we encounter, we are called, whether it's for 30 seconds or a lifetime, to be a gift for that person. Um, now, let's see. Because of original sin, it's hard to do that, right? think that if my purpose in life is to become a gift, it's simply to become who God made me to be, I should be able to do that. But original sin gets in the way all the time, uh, and so that idea of being a gift gets complicated. But fortunately for us, God is so determined to have us spend an eternity with him that he is using every circumstance in our life to bring us back to him. Friendship is one of the most important circumstances he uses. It does not matter if you are married, if you are single, if you are going to be married, if you are young, you are old, however, wherever you are in life, friendship matters. Um, but not just any kind of friendship. Uh, we've all experienced friendships that are less than what a friendship should be. So how do we live all of the beautiful stuff that John was talking about earlier? I would say there are nine hallmarks of authentic Catholic friendship, or sort of nine rules of Catholic friendship. Uh, the first, before I get into the rules, actually I should say what Catholic friendship is not. It does not mean that all your friends are Catholic, okay? <laughs> so... <laughs> My first experience of Catholic friendship was with Protestants. It's not with Catholics. Um, and there are plenty of Catholics out there who are not capable of entering yet into this type of friendship. So it does not mean that everyone goes to Mass on Sunday together. What does it mean? All right, well, first, Catholic friendship is real. When you say real in this culture, people usually think you mean one of two things. Either that you get to say whatever comes to mind, you know, no matter how hurtful, no matter how rude. It's just letting it all hang out there. That's not what I mean. Uh, nor do I mean sharing your entire existence on Facebook and sort of emotionally vomiting over social media and oversharing. Okay, oversharing is not being real. Being real means being yourself wherever you go. No masks, no personas, no voices. Somebody asked me once, they said, oh, you know, I love your writing. Where do you come up with your voice? And I'm thinking, I got one voice, and it takes enough energy to deal with this voice, so there's nothing left in me to make up another voice for writing. But that really is how some people think we all are, that you're one person at work, and you're another person at school. You're one person when you go out at night. You're another person when you show up at church on Sunday. That's what the devil wants. Okay, the devil loves fragmentation. Because if he can get you to be one person in the light and another person in the dark, if he can get you to be one person at work and another person at the club, he's got you, you know? He has got you. God loves integration. God made you. He thought you all up on his own, you know? Like, you were God's great idea. And he wants you to be you wherever you go. He thinks you are beautiful wherever you go. And so the goal of Catholic friendship is that you are with people who you can always be yourself. It does not mean you're going to tell all of your business always to the people who you are friends with at work. You know, there are things we keep to our, 
you know, more intimate circle of friendship, but you're always the same person. You know, there is, there's no mask, there's no putting on. It's what God wants, it's what we want. You know, we don't want to feel like we've pretended our way into a friendship, only for at some point that mask to slip and then to find out that we're not really loved. We all want to be loved for who we are, but in order to do that, we got to be who we are. Okay, second thing about Catholic friendship, Catholic friendship is fun. Um, I say this because when I was experiencing my conversion, I thought I was going to spend all of my time praying rosaries and singing Gregorian chant. And I love Gregorian chant, but that's not how I wanted to spend my time. Um, I was walking away from a scene where there was a fair bit of drinking and we must all be the fabulous, beautiful people and go to the best clubs and, you know, vacation at the best places and wear the best outfits. And I thought that was fun. Um, and I thought I was giving that up in order to wear, I don't know, I was really worried about how I was going to have to dress. I was like, do I have to wear long skirts all the time? Because that was in my head what Christian people did. They wore denim jumpers. Um, <laughs> very vain. It was a big concern of mine at the time. All right, but what I discovered was the opposite. What I had been doing for so many years in order to enjoy this fabulous club was I drank myself to the point where I could enjoy it. Um, I did not drink myself to the point where I didn't think too bad, but I had to drink in order to have fun. First rule of fun is if you have to drink in order to have fun, you are not having fun. Um, but what I, it, I always will talk about my conversion like it was like coming back to myself. I was remembering who I was when I was 10, 11, 12, what I loved. Really the child in me, you know, the child that responded to the things that God had made her to love. I was doing the things I wanted to do, not the things I was expected to do or thought that I was supposed to be having fun with. Now, my fun is going to look different from your fun. Um, I understand there are people who think running is fun. They do this <laughs> all of their own accord. Um, I, I, yeah, you go on and run. If that's what you think is fun, I will be walking. Um, so but God made all of us unique. And that's part of the joy of growing in holiness, is rediscovering the person who you are, rediscovering who he made you to be, and finding out what you think is really fun, and then having fun. And it doesn't matter if everybody thinks it's uncool, you're enjoying yourself. So Catholic friendship is fun. Uh, now to state the obvious, Catholic friendship leads you to Christ. Uh, it does this in two ways. There's the negative and the positive. The negative is that Catholic friendship is not throwing up obstacles to your growth in holiness. Um, if the people you are friends with are leading you to the confessional every Saturday, that's not Catholic friendship. <laughs> um, but it's not neutral either. Catholic friendship builds you up. It leads you on. It encourages you to grow closer to Christ. Um, I think one of the dangerous, most dangerous positions any of us can be in is to be the holiest person we know. Uh, it's very safe and it feels really good to be the one virtuous person among a culture group of friends that are not so virtuous. Um, when I was in college, I was the one who would not smoke pot, but I would go out to all the parties, you know, and I was like, I'm so good. Like, I'm not smoking pot. Mind you, I'm drinking myself to a point where I would have to go to confession if I were going to confession at the time, but I wasn't smoking pot, so I was the good one. Um, it's easy to get in that habit of mind. Like, yeah, I'm living with my boyfriend, but I'm not sleeping around like Susie is. Um, yeah, we're contracepting, but at least we're having children. Uh, yes, I'm drinking too much, but I'm not shooting up heroin. That's a really bad way to grow in holiness. <laughs> you know, it's the nice, slippery slope downwards. Um, Catholic friendship is going to be challenging you. It's going to be people who are setting an example for you. And you're like, wow, I need to be more generous. I need to listen better. I need to pray more. You know, those are the people you want to surround yourself with, people who make you go, okay, I can step up my game here. Um, it's also going to be leading you to Christ because prayer is involved. You know, your friends are praying for you. You're praying for them. You're praying together. That's not all you're doing all the time like I was worried about. But, you know, there's real prayer. There also is occasionally challenging each other and holding each other accountable. Um, Father talked about it a little bit this morning, and he's right. It's usually not a good idea to give unsolicited advice. Um, you want to kind of hold back as much as you can. But at the same time, Catholic friendship is about love, and it's not Barney love. Like, I love you, you love me, whatever makes you happy. You know, we're just one big happy family. Um, people are hurting themselves today. 
in very real ways. If you walked into a room and you saw a friend sitting there stabbing herself in the arm, you wouldn't be like, that's Sarah. She just likes stabbing herself. More power to her. You'd be like, Sarah, what are you doing? You, know, you need to stop that, honey, and here's why. And you do it in a loving way. You might you know, not necessarily grab the knife from her arm, though maybe if she's stabbing herself, you should. Um, but at a certain point, we need to be accept being challenged by our friends, and we need to be able to challenge our friends. Um, and do it in a way that hopefully will not cost us the friendship. But that is, at times, the most loving thing to do. Okay, Catholic friendship is safe. What do I mean by safe? All right, uh, since this is all true confession day. I think I have PTSD from junior high. Um, it was miserable. There's not the money in the world that could ever convince me to redo seventh and eighth grade. And that... <laughs> And that is because I never knew from one day to the next who my friends were. Um, I would go in one day, and Kelly and Mindy were my friends, and we didn't like Carrie. I was like, okay, we don't like Carrie. And then I would go in the next day, and it was Kelly and Carrie were my friends, and we didn't like Mindy. Okay, we don't like Mindy. Then I would go in the next day, and I was the one on the outs, and suddenly no one wanted to talk to me. Kelly always was on the in, so that may have been something to do with that. Not to name names or anything. Um, but it was so not safe. I never knew where I stood. I never felt loved. I never felt like I could trust them. I felt like if I did one thing wrong, I would be the girl on the outs the next day. Um, that doesn't happen in Catholic friendship. You know, in Catholic friendship, everyone recognizes the dignity of the other. You look at the other person and you see the image of God standing before you. And so you're not violating trust. You're not stealing people's boyfriends or girlfriends. You're not talking about each other behind your back. You're loving and accepting the other. And that gives you the freedom to know that even when you do make a fool of yourself, even when you, the mask is off and you're being completely who you are and that part of you is not always lovable, you know, that those friends are still going to be there. So Catholic friendship is safe. Uh, it's also inclusive. Again, we go back to junior high. Um, Clicks dominate junior highs, right? We all remember the cliques. You know, you've got the cool girls, you've got the jocks, you've got the, the smart kids who are in the National Honor Society. Um, it's all about finding your little niche and fitting in, and everyone else is shut out. That's not Catholic friendship. Um, yes, you can have closer friends. Jesus had his inner circle. We all need a few people who we can really, truly share the fullness of our life with. Um, but we should be wanting our social circle to expand. Every person out there is a unique, unrepeatable image of God. So I'm going to learn something from you about God that I'll never learn from somebody else, and from you, and from you. Each of you is an opportunity for me to encounter and understand God in a new way. So that in itself should make us want to be making new friends. Um, and sometimes we will end up, maybe when we're 20, 40, or 60, making a new best friend. You know, we're never too old to make new best friends. Um, at other times, we will meet someone and introduce them to somebody else, and that will give them a new best friend. You know, so it's a continual expansion. I'm a, I like to entertain a lot. Obviously, I run a food and hospitality blog, not when I'm writing books, but the rest of the time, I like to entertain a lot. And for years, I would have this dinner party every Thursday night, and I would have maybe 20 to 30 adults and 20 to 30 kids. Um, it's kind of crazy. I know. <laughs> But then everybody, see, we could do it as long as people only had three, four, or five kids, but at a certain point, the kids just were outmanning us, and we couldn't, we couldn't do it every week anymore. But I, would, I was just always inviting everyone, someone new to town, come to dinner. You know, I'd meet somebody who'd been living there for a while I didn't know, come to dinner. I knew they weren't going to come every week, but one of those times, I did make a new best friend. Um, and other times, they came, and they met other moms, and so they got invited to a mom's group, and suddenly they had a circle to belong to, or they met another married couple that they clicked with. So that's the joy of being inclusive. You're continually encountering new images of God and connecting other people. Um, all right, six, Catholic friendship calls you out of yourself. Life is about becoming a gift, and you do not become a gift by staying home and watching television or playing Xbox, right? Shocking, I know. Um, you become a gift by sacrificing and serving and dying to yourself. When you are married or a priest or religious, you have a one-up on single people because that dying to yourself is built into the vocation. There's a child there who has to be fed, and it doesn't matter that you would rather take a bath. You really have to feed the child. Um, so there's all those opportunities. When you're single, you have to look a little bit harder. 
You have to look for who needs your love, who needs your attention. How can I die to myself today? How can I skip the thing I want to do and do the thing someone really needs me to do? Um, so I think, so in terms of just listening to a friend who's had a bad day when you would rather watch a Buffy the Vampire Slayer marathon, it's one way to do it. Making a meal for a new mom or for the wife who just lost her husband. Um, helping a friend out, paint a room. You know, maybe you just want to read your book, but your friends just bought a new house and their house needs painting. Take a night to go help them paint. Just look for little opportunities to die to yourself. Um, seven, Catholic friendship is diverse. I don't mean it should look like a gap ad. You know, if this is my black friend and my Latina friend and my Asian friend, we have two white people. That's not what your circle of friends should look like, okay? That's not what I mean when I say diverse. I mean your group of friends should look like the body of Christ. And the body of Christ has young people and it has older people. It has people who are black and people who are white, people who experience same-sex attraction and people who experience being attracted to one woman after another. Um, you know, it's... <laughs> That's, the, that's who's sitting in the church on Sundays. You got the womanizer, you've got the celibate, you've got the old people. You should be friends with people who come from all those different walks of life. Um, from each of them, you will learn something new. From each of them, you will be challenged to grow in a new way. Uh, one of my favorite stories when I was doing the American Catholic Almanac was about this World War I chaplain who went on to become a great theologian and a pastor in New York City. He actually has a statue at one, side, one end of Times Square. So if you ever go to New York City, look for Father Duffy, Father Francis Duffy's statue. But when Father Duffy died, there were 30,000 people that turned out for his funeral. He was a genius at the art of friendship. Uh, one rich, there's a story of one rich lady thought that she was all hoity-toity and she should be able to get up in front of the line. So she was cutting the poor riffraff and a policeman stopped her. He's like, lady, what do you think you're doing? She goes, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I was a friend of Father Duffy's. And he goes, honey, everyone in New York was a friend of Father Duffy's. <laughs> Did everyone in New York know Father Duffy's, Duffy's most intimate business? No, you know, but everyone felt so loved by him, so known by him when they encountered him that they considered him a friend. So that's what we're aiming for. All right, eight, Catholic friendship is seasonal. What do I mean by seasonal? Um, life is about becoming holy, right? And we've already discussed that is not easy because of that whole thing called original sin. Uh, so God has to mix it up on us. When uh, St. Paul talks about the life of holiness, it's often as a runner running a race. If you wanted to become the best runner in the world, you would not only run when it was 70 degrees and sunny with a light breeze on a nice flat track after you'd had eight hours of sleep and you were in a great mood and had the perfect balance of carbohydrates and protein at your last three meals. Um, <laughs> You would not be much of a runner. No, if you want to be a great runner, you've got to run in the rain and the cold when you're hungry and you're sick and up hills and down mountains and on sand. It's got to be like one big chariots of fire experience if you're going to become a great runner. Um, well, that's how holiness works, all right? We've got to change it up a little bit. Fortunately, life does it for us. People are always getting married and having babies and moving and dying. So we're continually being forced to go, Okay, how do I give a gift? Of, how do I make a gift of myself now in this circumstance? Um, one of the hardest opportunities, or one of the hardest experiences I ever had, was at the end of grad school. Um, I'd worked my way through grad school, so it took longer. And over the course of those five years, I was at the center of this great, big, wonderful social circle, and my house was the life of the party, and people were in and out. We didn't lock the doors. Steubenville's like the hood. Um, <laughs> you always lock the doors, but we had so many people in and out, it was easier not to lock the doors. And then everyone graduated, and they left, all virtually at the same time. And I'm left in Steubenville with this piece of real estate. It's, I was telling Father Scalia earlier, you know, in The Princess Bride, when it's like, you know, never go in with Sicilian on a death in the line, when there's a death in, you know, when there's death is on the line, never get into a land war in Asia. Never buy real estate in Steubenville should be on that list. Um, <laughs> the university is wonderful. The town, it's a little hard to unload a house. So I'm in this big house, and all my friends are gone, and I was alone. And I, I did not know what to do with myself. But that became, over the course of the next two years, 
one of the greatest experiences for spiritual growth I had. I had to be by myself again. I had to learn to enjoy my own company again. I had to depend on God again. Um, it is overwhelming. It is not always fun. But recognizing the seasons are going to come and go, and you always have to say, all right, God, how are you calling me to make a gift of myself today in this circumstance, knowing that that circumstance is going to change eventually? That helps. All right, last, ninth, Rule of Catholic friendship. Catholic friendship is personal. And this is what John was talking about earlier. Um, Catholic friendship is embodied. And we like to do it through screens. You know, we want to do it through phones and internet chat rooms and social media sites. But that's not how God made us to be. He gave us bodies. Not just because he thought that would be a great, no, this will be fun. We'll see what happens. Like, he made us to love in bodies. He made us to communicate with our bodies. That's why Facebook's always such a disaster when we try to have actual conversations because you can't hear tones. You can't see the look in the voice. You can't pat somebody on the arm and let them know you're really being affectionate. We need bodies in order to communicate properly. Um, we also need to be friends in bodies because that's what allows us to be ourselves. You know, online, we can always be the best version of ourselves on Facebook, on Twitter. We're in control then. We're in control of how we're presenting ourselves. We're in control of how people see us. You can't always do that in the body. You know, there's days you're having a bad day, and if someone says two words to you, you're going to burst out into tears, and that may just be me that does that occasionally. I'm sure there's some of you that don't burst out into tears <laughs> randomly. You know, but that's being vulnerable. Friendship requires vulnerability. It requires allowing people to see you at your worst so that you know they love you and not just the image of you that you are projecting. Um, Catholic friendship is also embodied because that's what's going to make us the happiest. You know, my best friend, my two best female friends, one lives in Michigan, one lives in Washington State. I have to talk to them. I love the phone because I can talk to them that way. Um, Facebook is a great distraction. I don't know how writers distracted themselves before Facebook. Um, <laughs> but no phone call with one of my best friends is going to compare with when they come for a visit and we're sitting around my kitchen table drinking wine and eating, you know, jalapenos wrapped in bacon and stuffed with cream cheese. Like, you know, that's happiness, not just the conversation. Um, no debate on Facebook is ever going to compare to the high you get from a debate around a dinner table. Um, there is going to be no internet chat room that can compare to a day at the beach with your friends. Like, we need to see each other's eyes. We need to hear each other's voices. We need to know each other's touch. That's what love, you know, demands. Uh, my boyfriend says, it's, I think it's very wise, um, you know, Facebook is not the foretaste of heaven. People sometimes say, oh, you know, you get all these different people from all these different worlds. No, Facebook is not the foretaste of heaven. The dance or the dinner party are the foretaste of heaven. Facebook, texting, social media, they're good in as much as they get us to the dance. They're good for the invites. They're good for getting us to the dinner party. But they're never going to be that. They're never going to give us what we really need. Okay. Before I wrap it up, I want to get even more practical and talk about how. You know, how do we have friendships that are fun and safe and real and inclusive and diverse? Well, if you want friendships that are real, you have to figure out who you are. Um, you have to know who the person is behind the mask. A lot of us, many, many people for years and years are just living up to other people's expectations. You know, you're told at six that you should be playing soccer, so you play soccer for 20 years. You're told at eight, that what's going to make mom and dad happy is if you're always, you know, silent and, you know, very silent and quiet and meek. But is that actually you? Are you silent? Do you like soccer? What do you like to do in your free time? Um, spending time by yourself, learning to enjoy your own company is an essential part of learning who you are. Even more essential is spending time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. You know, we never experience ourselves in a more real, intimate way. We never know ourselves as well and see ourselves as well as when we stand before God. And in the Eucharist, God is with us in the flesh. You know, He is there. Um, his glory is no greater, going to be no greater at the end of time than it is when He's in the monstrance. We just can't see it as much. So to put ourselves before that glory, to discover who we are, you know, then we know who we are and we can go out and be it. Um, if you want friendships that are fun, you have to be open to new experiences. Uh, my roommate, who's so cute, she's 29, 
she, when I was turning 40, she was trying to console me. She says, oh, you know, they say life begins at 40. The rest is just practice. Um, <laughs> it's like, yay, 29-year-old. Uh, no, I actually don't. <laughs> I don't mind being 40. 20s are great. 30s are better. I expect 40s to be better still. But it is true that the Emily I am today is not the Emily I was 15 years ago. If you had told me 15 years ago that I would enjoy knitting or reglazing windows um, or my latest baseball, like I'm listening to sports radio now, even when my boyfriend isn't in the car, um, I would have thought you were crazy. That's not me. But I found out it was me. You know, life is becoming more who you are. So you're always discovering that there are new things to love and new things that make you happy. And that makes life a lot more fun. I mean, if I were doing the same things I was doing at 25, that would be boring. <sighs> All right. If you want friendships that lead you closer to Christ, um, first you have to deal with the toxic friendships in your life. Uh, the first mode of dealing with the toxic friendships I don't, is not usually just to cut that person off is to change the context in which you relate. Uh, when I was going out and drinking with my friends, I would say, I'm being such a good influence on them. It's so good that I'm here. I was not being a good influence on them. They were still smoking pot. They were still sleeping around. Nobody, I was just with them while they were doing it. That's all that was happening. Um, <laughs> when I became a good influence was when I stopped going into those situations that were near occasions of sin or sin and started saying, hey, let's have dinner. Hey, why don't you come over and work on a house project with me or watch a movie? I would relate to them in situations where I could actually relate to them. You know, and from there, you know, the friendships became non-toxic. Now, there are times that's not going to happen. There are relationships you just have to walk away from, and you have to do that with forgiveness in your heart and pray for them, but cut, cut the situation off. Um, but in addition to walking away from toxic friendships or changing them, you have to seek out people who will help you grow in relationship to, with Christ. That's not always going to happen easily or quickly. Coming to a courage conference, going to courage chapters in your town, that's great. Um, going to your parish, events at your parish to meet people there. Going to nursing homes. You know, there are so many wonderful, holy Catholic men and women who are sitting by themselves every day, and we have so much to learn from them. You know, they can be spiritual mothers and fathers to us, but we have to seek them out. So put yourselves in context, some expected, some not expected, where you're going to meet people, and be patient. You know, I had that long two-year season where I was like, I'm so done with Steubenville. And then God moved this wonderful Catholic family in right next door to me, and the woman was my age, and we had so much fun together. It was like having a roommate, but she didn't. She lived with her husband and kids. Um, <laughs> it was like the best. She could come over, and then she could go back. Um, so if you're patient, you know, those friendships will come, but you have to be open to them. Let's see. If you want friendships that are safe, there is no guarantee on this, but the best way usually to achieve it is to be the kind of friend that you want to be. You have to make your friendship situation safe. You have to not talk about people behind their back. You have to not be manipulative. You have to give them no reason to doubt that you can be trusted with their husband or their wife or their boyfriend or their girlfriend. Um, if you create an environment where safe friendship can flourish, that's about as much as you can do. And I've seen it work. I remember um, back in grad school, one of my roommate's friends came to student bill, was going to start. And she came over to visit us, and she was getting ready to paint her apartment. I said, oh, I'll be happy to help you. You know, let me, let me come over and help you. And she's like, okay. And my friend Jessica told me later, she goes, yeah, Carrie just didn't know what to make of that. She thought it was just so odd that you were being so nice, and she wanted to know if it was for real. And I was like, well, you told her it was, right? She said, yeah, I told her. That's just, you know, that's just how we operate around here. And if you flash forward a few years later, you see Carrie greeting new people coming to town going, oh, I'll come help you paint. Can I make you a cake for your birthday? You know, when you act a certain way, it can be contagious. Um, how about inclusive? Invite people to do things. You know, you've got to channel your inner extrovert. Um, there are so many people out there waiting to be included, waiting to be invited, waiting to just have someone say, hey, I see you. Come on in, join us. Um, that dinner party, I don't think I've ever had anyone turn me down um, unless they really did have something going on, and they would always say, please invite us again. People want to be invited. You are not going to be rejected. You know, that's, they might have to be a little persistent if their schedule is busy, but they're not rejecting you for the inviting. They're rejecting you because they don't know how to balance their schedule, like me sometimes. Um, <laughs> all right, friendship that calls you out of yourself. Uh, 
some people are very good at this. They know how to serve, they know how to give. Others tend to be more focused inward, and so you have to focus on how you can change that. Um, few little ways, one is to play a game, and I, would do, I do this whenever I'm getting too caught up in my own issues or my own problems, and I realize I'm not being attentive enough to the people around me, and I say, okay, who's one person today that I can do something nice for? Who's someone I can send an encouraging note to? Who's someone I can buy a Starbucks for? Who's someone I can call or drop by? Just one person. And if you start with one person a day, it becomes a habit, a way of thinking about, who can I die to myself for today? Um, you want to be aware of how much you talk about yourself. Uh, that was something that a woman who was a real spiritual mother pointed out to me when I was, oh, 23, 24. And she said, and just start paying attention to how many times you say the word I in conversation. Uh, and I did, and it was very disturbing. And, <laughs> um, and so it's something I have been working consciously at for a very long time and looking around saying, I, I, I. But I'm trying to share my wisdom and experience with you so I can talk about I here. But it is. Pay attention to how much you're talking about yourself. Um, even just when someone calls you on the phone or you call somebody else on the phone, which is even harder, not launching straight into, oh, my gosh, you wouldn't believe what this guy said or he did this again or my boss – but instead saying, hi, how are you? How is your day? Asking that question first to give them the chance to tell you that, oh, maybe their grandma died or their child's been throwing up for the past 24 hours prevents you from being a very selfish, obnoxious friend. Um, so just being attentive to that. Diverse, reach out to people who are different than you. Uh, one of the best friendships that I made during that two-year dry spell was with a woman who was 55, and I was you know, in my early 30s. She ended up becoming a wonderful spiritual mother to me. I owe her so much. And I never would have thought, oh, sure, I could be a friend with a woman who's 20-plus odd years older than me. But she was a great friend. She was a great decorator, too. So we had lots of fun doing the house up and all sorts of things like that. Um, my boyfriend, Chris, is also great. Uh, there's a homeless man who opens the door for people at Mass. He's just always there. And lots of people ignore him. Other people say hi. Chris started asking him out to lunch. And he takes him out to lunch once a week. And when he talks about John, he does not say, the homeless guy who opens the door at Mass. He says, my friend John. And John thinks of my friend Chris. You can do that with the people at your parish. You can do that with the lady who sells you coffee every morning at the store. You don't have to have deep, intimate relationships with her. You don't have to take her out for coffee. But you can ask her, how's your day going? You can ask her about her kid. And then you can remember to follow up about what she said. You know, just building those types of intimate relations where you're just showing people you care. That's what Father Duffy did. That's what we can do, too. Um, seasonal, learn to roll with change. Don't lament the past. Don't hold on to it. It's very easy to dwell on the glory days. Recognize that God is there in everything. You know, he's there in this moment that feels so challenging. And keep going back to the idea it's seasonal. It will change. One of the great things about where I'm at now is I'm seeing my friends who 10 years ago or 15 years ago were drowning in the little babies. You know, they couldn't get out. They couldn't see anyone. They felt so isolated. Now they've got a 15-year-old. They're like, hey, <laughs> you babysit all the other kids. We're going out. Um, life changes. People change. Situations change. You have to remind yourself of that in your head so that you can keep feeling it in your heart. Um, social media and technology. Use it more sparingly. If you can call, call. Don't text. Um, if you have a friend on Facebook and you're going to be passing by their town, see if they'll meet up in real life. Um, always be trying to make your relationships more embodied. It's, it's an impossible thing that all relationships will be embodied all the time in our culture unless you live in a cloistered monastery and you know nobody's on Facebook and you're all engaging each other. Um, but always be going for the more more embodied. Uh, last but not least, this doesn't tie into those points, but I would say you need to look to resurrect hospitality. You know, hospitality is uh, charism. You know, it's, it's connected to our life in the body of Christ, and it's something that we're all expected to do. We are all supposed to feed the stranger. We are all supposed to open our door to the person who needs a home. Um, you do not have to throw fancy five-course dinner parties to be exercising hospitality. You can be arranging a happy hour at the bar. You know That's the way you exercise hospitality. You can have a few friends over for a movie night. That's the way you exercise hospitality. Um, hospitality makes demands on us because it requires us to be vulnerable. 
Uh, it requires people to see that we might have dust bunnies, that you know, we might not be the best cook, that our children might not be the best behaved children. You know, that's a vulnerability, and so it's hard for people. We're also so busy, but that's where life and joy and friendships are built. You know, when we open our home to other people, when we open our lives to other people, we start to form the close bonds of friendship and communion that we need to thrive. Um, so Sunday brunch, Tuesday night movie nights, those are good. Um, doesn't have to fa be fancy, does have to be regular. You know, if you're really looking to build community in your in where you are, um, it helps. Like I had my Thursday night dinners. Everyone always knew dinner was on Thursday night at Emily's, and if you can't go one week, you can go another week. Uh, it gives people the freedom to come as their schedule allows. Uh, I do think invitations should be personal. Facebook invites. Facebook's good for lots of things, but not for invites. When everyone gets Facebook invites, they don't feel like they're actually wanted at an event. They feel like you're just broadcasting it to your entire friends list, regardless of where they lived. I mean, I get invites to parties and 10 hours away from me, and I'm like, oh yeah, you really, you really want me there. Um, when you ask a person to come, they're much more likely to respond. I throw a big fancy party every year. Um, because fancy parties are still fun to do every once in a while. It's like high feast days, like Easter and Christmas. You know, I have Emily's fancy Christmas party where we all dress up and pretend we don't live in Steubenville. And, <laughs> you know, I bust out the silver and the fancy appetizers and the cocktails. And I actually do um, hand-printed invitations. We do, like, individual mail. We mail out the invitations. It's like a one-woman stand against creeping barbarism. Um, <laughs> that I will fight against the demise of civilization. But you don't have to do that. You just call someone up on the phone. You can send him an email. You can ask them to come over when you see him after church. Just make it personal. That lets people know that you want them, not just a warm body in your home. Um, if you are not called to take on large dinner parties, that is okay. You can do dishes for those who are. I have an internal debt to everyone who does dishes after one of my parties. Um, but basically, this isn't brain surgery. You know, We knew how to do this when we were three years old. This is what we are made for. And you don't have to be holy in order to have this kind of friendship. This is not some eschatological vision of friendship, you know, where we're going to be standing before God, the beatific vision, and finally we're going to be able to have real, safe, inclusive friendships. No, this is how you get to the beatific vision, you know, through loving in a real, safe, trusting, inclusive way, you become the person who gets to stand before God. Friendship is one of the ways we grow in holiness. So not brain surgery. It will help you grow in holiness. And if all else fails, the most practical piece of advice I can give you is just think about what everyone acted like in junior high and then do the opposite. <laughs> so I have 15 minutes to do questions. So um, that's it. Yeah. I always hate the applause bits at the end of talks. I'm like, let's just go to questions. <laughs> let's talk. So does anyone have any questions? Yes, back there. I have a question. When is like, a lot of my friends, they just want to hang out with me, and I can't get like two or three people, and then I have relatives who like, my aunt and my uncle and my cousin and stuff. And it's like, I don't really want to see me with a friend. They just want to see me. So how, and I just don't have time. Like, I can't really... Yeah, that's hard. I mean, I think it's important to mix social groups and mix family and friends. Um, it's always you always want to be spending time with the people who you're close to and have some of that one on one personal time. But bringing people together in large groups, it may be uncomfortable for them at first but it can end up being a great service to them because they form more friendships. So we're not just meant to always be, you know, staring our friends eye to eye. That's more eros, you know, the, the you and me. It's, it's us looking at something together. And you can have three people looking at something together or four people looking at something together. So just sort of slowly, gradually finding ways that you can introduce them to each other, get them comfortable with each other, finding something you have in common to do together. Um, because, yeah, we're, we only have so much time in life, so... First of all, thank you for reinviting, uh, inviting us to see the value of, of friendship. It's something that I believe is very 
uh, undermined in Quebec culture. Um, and now, without really wanting to mix your stuff with previous stuff, uh, so when you are cultivating these friendships, there are curating bonds. And uh, some, sometimes the, the romance that we have talked about being dangerous uh, starts to create. Either will it be you know, a married man with women's friends or somebody in the same sex. Uh, what are the ways to very balancedly, without just stop talking to people, try to realize is this is uh, is this a safe place for me to be at? Yeah. Uh, like John, you know, there's there's things I can speak to and things I can't. I can speak to my own experience as a single woman who has lots of close male friends, um, and how I've navigated that. And then you can maybe take what I've done, and there's got to be something in there that will apply. Um, I basically what I learned is that male friends. For me, opposite sex friends, people who I might end up being rom romantically interested in, too, I have to watch some of what I would talk to them about. Um, so I would not go crying to a male friend. I would go crying to a female friend. Um, so when I would realize that somebody might be romantically interested in me, that's when I started putting up more boundaries. So we could do stuff together in groups, and that was great. And I loved hanging out with them, but I wasn't going to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them. Um, I always made it clear that I was not interested, you know, not necessarily in a rude way, but maybe talking about another guy or, you know, finding a ways to help them know. <laughs> Subtle, yeah, isn't he so cute? I wish he'd ask me out. Um, <laughs> not you. <laughs> uh, so that helped. In terms of, I think for me, what helped, there was no, and there were no friends with benefits, no friends with benefits, no hanky panky. Um, that's because you can deal with the sort of romantic notion when it comes up, but as soon as the physicality comes in, it's just all downhill from there. So, no friends with benefits, not too emotional. Um, watching the time I spend alone with people who I could be interested in, um, not building close friends with someone's husband, obviously. I'm, you know, I have friends, male friends that are married, and I love them, but I'm not going to go to them, I'm going to go to their wife. I'm going to be primar primarily friends with the wife. But I think part of it is just eventually how you come to see the person. You know, what I, why I was so careful with men who might have been interested in me, who I was not interested in, was I saw how precious they were, and I knew there was some woman out there who was right for them. And I didn't want to use them. I didn't want to lead them on. I didn't want to put them in a situation that was not safe for them. Um, it's one of the reasons I didn't have serious relationships is because um, I saw what dating was for, and I knew what I wanted, and I wasn't going to be in a relationship that would just make me feel good for a little while. I wasn't going to use anyone that way, and so I think the clearer of a vision you have of the dignity of the other person and what is good for them, the less of a temptation it is in a certain way because you don't want to do anything that's going to hurt them or harm them or harm yourself. And so there's a natural reticence to put yourself in those situations. Um, and you clue in a lot faster when they come around. But it takes time. And I had my fair share of, you know, not being as nice as I should have been before I eventually learned how to navigate it. So it took me 40 years. Hopefully it won't take you that long. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to add uh, the gay perspective on this is because when I was younger, yes, I had a nice apartment and I would have parties. So I got to be, it was very much, I was the gay guy who could give good parties. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, uh, the friendships I had, it tended then to be exclusively gay, though I wanted other uh, straight couples coming and stuff like that. But they didn't feel so comfortable with that. So it really did put me back into a ghetto that I didn't want to be in. So my solution for me was to make sure that I stopped doing that um, because it, it, it got to be too obvious to me type of thing. It was too, too much of a gay thing. So I, I would make sure I would, uh, you know, I belonged to a good parish. You know, if they had functions, I would go there. Or, um, but I took it out of my apartment so it wasn't too personal and then I had to look for other activities because I wanted to meet friends too. One difference with your parties, even though I'm going to 
say this is, is that eventually you were going to get married. You know, that, that's part of it. For me, I had to, um, am I going to have a life of uh, uh, second removal of friends and no intimate friends? Because it, it was not, I had to be careful not to say, I'm out looking. And uh, so that was uh, some of the minefields I had to walk on that. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out for. Um, no, I think that's a good point, is that it can't all be, you have to figure out what situations are best for you and what's building authentic community. And that was not building the community you really longed for and craved, and so you looked for different ways to do it. So that's the kind of mixing it up, finding new ways. I would say, still no ring on the finger, um, <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to get married, you know, and believe me, a year ago I thought I was never going to get married. Um, there's a huge crisis for single people in the church today because pickings are so slim. And there are many wonderful people who you would think in a different age, like, of course they'll get married. Um, I think a lot of single people, once you pass 35, you start to presume you're not. So you're just like, okay, I'm going to be a chaste, faithful Catholic for the next 40 years. Um, and that made my friendships more important, not less. And I really did reach out to the married couples in, at that, because I'm like, I need that from them. I need the children. I need to see what they're going through to remember that marriage is its own particular cross. So that's where the diversity comes in, too, is that everyone has their own cross. Life is so hard. <laughs> you know, married, single, same-sex attracted, opposites attract. Like, it's just, life is hard. Being holy, it's a hard, hard journey. So the more people you're friends with, the more people you're seeing bear those crosses and work through those struggles, the less you feel sort of tempted to do the self-pity party and are like, okay, God, they're getting the grace somehow to get through this, so you got to give me the grace. And I think that was really wise of you to reach out to, to other people. Okay, so yes. Uh, jealousy between friends. Like, this hasn't happened to me recently, but I had a friend that I was very close to, and then he started becoming really close to somebody else, and I was jealous, not in a romantic way, but just, you know, like... What, he likes him better than me, and you know, yeah. how do you guard against that kind of possessiveness of certain friends? Um, yeah, I mean that happens all the time with girls. You know, girl, <laughs> that happens all the time. Um, I think it's, gosh, how do you deal with that? Um, so. It, do, it, it can be hurtful when suddenly you feel like you're the friend who's gotten the shaft and you're on the out. Um, I think you keep loving that other friend and you look for ways that, oh, maybe the three of us could do something together and you try to form those relationships. But also sometimes that's God saying, okay, there's somebody else I've got you know, who really needs your friendship and the time that you used to be spending with that person. I'm going to have you, you know, invest in this other friendship. So it, it's that seasonal. It's rolling with it. Friendships are always changing and we we love all of our friends differently, but at different times we need something from another person. We need something from a friendship um, that we can't get from one friendship, and so we seek it out. So not taking it personally, um, offering it up like a good Catholic. I don't know. <laughs> it's not the best answer, but no, it's, it's just one of those things you're always trying to deal with, and I don't think it ever goes away because someone's feelings are always going to get hurt. We all feel rejection. We all want to feel loved. Um, so holiness. I think if you're really, really holy, it won't bother you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know this because I'm not that holy. Holiness, that's, that's the answer. There we go. I don't know. Does that help at all? Okay. <laughs> all right. Anyone else? Yes, Paul. I'd like to address what this fellow over here said about it gets a lot harder uh, in the situation with my brothers and sisters who have same-sex attraction because that's exactly what happened. It, it actually is one of our challenges. And he, he spoke about the beautiful solution, and that is if you're involved in the church, and I found this as a person of same-sex attraction, he was very open in my church. I've given speeches at the Bible studies of, about what the Lord has done. And, and so the public situations, the picnics, the dinners, the fish fries, they're they're always so loving, they're always so loving in church, they come up to me afterwards and want to know what's going on with birds and the world. So, so it's a beautiful uh, friendship situation. And then, though, to address the other aspect outside of the church, it's not so, something that's less public, 
is what we're doing here. The, and, and however God has made this happen, or I shouldn't say God has made it happen, however God has permitted it to happen, the friends in this room, the friends that I've met through courage, the friends who have loved God more than anything else in their life, and it's the most important thing, those friends who think like we do and want to be chased to the Lord, it sounds like an impossible task, but those friends are what gives us the support. Those are our friends. Those are our Emily's dinner parties. And we might be too far away to have Emily's dinner parties or not able to cook like me. But, but, that, but that support is out there. And, and that's why we're here today. And I just think that sometimes we feel all alone because we may live in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and there's nobody around that we can talk to on a one-to-one. -one. But if we make the effort, we really can. So, so I think that is our, through our brothers and sisters. And it's, I think it's so beautiful. I wish that I, what I want to see is you guys in an arena in ten years, like that, that's what I want to see. I want this to be the size of your local courage chapter, you know, and you guys in an arena. Because yeah, the more of you coming together, the more support you can give each other. The, Satan loves us to feel like we're alone. You know, Satan always wants us to feel like we're alone, like nobody else understands us. And so, being vulnerable, reaching out, seeking out, traveling across the country to come to an event like this, it's one of the best things you can do to form those friendships. Yes. So when we're doing that, we're doing it for ourselves, but we're doing it for them too. So it just comes back and back and forth. And it's a give and a give and it's take and take and take. It's just so good. It is beautiful. Thanks for letting me come. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice. Beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you.